Appreciate all you guys coming. What a, a great crowd for our... I'll have to go back and do some research. This is our third or fourth annual Christmas bass fishing seminar. And with it being right before Christmas, we always like to get our get our Santa Claus on. And Santa Claus even grew a beard with a lot of gray in it for us this year. The former <laughs> Heath Taylor from Smash Tech Custom Baits is here. And he brought a box full of swim baits and plastics that we're going to give away tonight. We've got boxes like this right here that are loaded up with baits. we got four of those ready to go. And right back there, next to Court Huckins, is a rod and reel that we brought to give away. That is, that's not a six hits rod. That's from my last rod sponsor, but that is one of the best Alabama rig rods you'll ever throw at them. I'm thinking, that's a limit rod. I'm thinking with the low water conditions that we have right now, right, that we're going to have for a prolonged time at Lake Fork, and really a lot of lakes in the area are low because we have, we're kind of in a drought. We were already three foot low before they started pulling on the lake to work on the dam here. Uh, with those conditions, it's going to put less grass in the lake, and it's going to really, with new live sonar, for a lot of us have live sonar now, that Alabama rig is going to be a mainstay in your boat. It's kind of going to become a year-round bait. You can really use year-round in low water conditions. So I had an old Alabama rig rod that I don't use anymore, so I grabbed that one, put a lose reel, a used lose reel on it, and it's not brand new stuff. This stuff, a lot of this stuff in these boxes even, is stuff that I've already fished with, and you may open your box and be like, dang, these crankbaits are beat to heck. That's the one you want to throw. <laughs> the ones that are beat up, throw that one first because I, I fished with it a bunch if it's beat up. So um, that's great. So we're going to talk low water conditions, do Christmas giveaways. We're going to get all that done tonight. Uh, one thing I want to give a shout out. Maze, I know you got one. T tell us the story on this right here. So we want to give a shout out to whoever done this. Yep. So this uh my cousin michael cates he's one of your followers as well okay um he ran into this jack daniels rep there in arkansas and uh had these made just for me and you. so these are custom bottles of gentleman jack and it says your lake fort guy billy lawson no way. and duh lake fort guy cody Mays. <laughs> <laughs> right there check that out that's good stuff that's really cool so thank you to mr cates yep. mr cates thank you very much for that um well, let's, let's get it. What we're going to do, we're going to do some giveaways right off the bat. We're going to do some smash tech giveaways right off the bat. And then the boxes and the rod, there's going to be a competition for those at the end. I'll tell you what it's going to be so you guys can start thinking. This was suggested by somebody on a live stream or maybe last year. I don't remember, but I, I wish I could give them credit. I can't remember their name. But you guys have got to stump me with Lake Fork Trivia. So if you make me not know the answer to a question on some Lake Fork Trivia then you get to win one of the prizes, one of the big prizes, the boxes that are, or the rock. So start thinking about your questions for we're gonna do those at the end of the seminar. Right now, we're gonna give away some Smash Tech baits. Uh, before we do that, we gotta do this. I do that all the time, don't I? But hey, this is uh, as happy as we are to be able to be here and, and as grateful as we are to uh, be able to give stuff away. It is Christmas time. And one of my, I love Christmas. And I also hate Christmas. And that, I know that's bad. I mean, my kids call me the Grinch, you know. Um, my problem with Christmas is we, we lose the message. It's wonderful to have them with me. It's wonderful to see their faces on Christmas Day. But we lose, we lose the importance of the holiday a lot because of all the pageantry and, you know, our own selfish comforts and things that go on. We're off work. We're around family. We're eating good food. Man, it's just a wonderful time of year. But let's remember why we're, we're taking that time off and spending time with our loved ones to do that. It's to honor our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Because that's the day that God sent His Son. And it's also a little bit sad when you think about that. We're so messed up. All of us. Every human being that's ever walked this earth is so jacked up that our Creator had to send His only Son to die for us so we could be forgiven because we can't do right. And that's everybody in here and myself. I'm one of the worst ones. And say everybody that's ever walked this earth is so messed up that our Creator had to give His only Son. And Christmas Day is the day that we choose to celebrate when He sent our Savior, His Son, Jesus Christ. So um, we got to put that message out there. A lot of people don't do that on social media, but we do here at this channel. We always will as long as I'm running it. So uh, thank you all for bearing with us on that. Let's do some giveaways. We've got tons of stuff here. I'm going to get a couple of... Can I get some Santa helpers back here? Mm -hmm. Amazing. Sure. Will y'all be saying as helpers? Yeah. Tell you what we're going to do. We're just going to go away, go, go around the room, and we'll send you to the left, send you to the right. And I want you, 
don't include those kids back there in the corner, but everybody else, <laughs> I want you to just have them take one and move on to the next one. Right just open the bags, take one, move on to the next one. <clears throat> well, I'm glad. I've been trying to get online and it says sold out. Sold, sold out. out. <laughs> sold out. Well, that means All right. you got to be pretty quick getting fishing tackle these days. It's, uh, it's something else. Loop all the way around. Please tell my son Jeff. He ain't going to fry. Bone fry is an excellent Carolina rig bait. Here we go. I'm actually coming at you. Low water conditions. It's uh, and these are these are two guys right here that have as much experience fishing East Texas. I mean, that's two lifetimes of experience. Heath grew up in Pittsburgh and has fished his whole life. David grew up in Beaumont and has been, been fishing Lake Fork for forever since it existed. So this is literally two lifetimes worth of fishing experience in East Texas. And they're long lifetimes because they got there's a lot of gray between those two. <laughs> a lot of gray. I'm not that old. You're saying I'm old? Well, you're, yeah, he's got more gray yeah, than I'm, I'm like. a little gray. I'm your your beard this year looks different than it did last year. It's more gray every time. Yeah. There's, there's no hair here and, and lots of gray here. It's just falling off and you're catching it, right? That's it? All right, all right. But anyways, two guys have a ton of experience, and I'm sure that these two gentlemen have probably seen lakes in just about every condition you can, I would imagine, with the way they're both very, very adamant fishers year-round every year. Um, that being said, low water in East Texas can be dangerous, Okay. We got all the lakes. One, the first thing you need to think about is navigation and getting back to the boat ramp safely. I mean, there's there's nothing that we do in fishing, even at the highest levels, that's worth going in the water when it's cold outside this time of year, guys. I mean, that that can be the end of it. I mean, you can lose your life real quick. You need to respect the water, especially when it's cold. You get in cold water. If it gets colder than it is now, when that water starts getting in the low 50s, man, it's hard to swim in that for very long at all. Mm -hmm. So, if, if there's anything sketchy going on at all, wear your life jacket. Um, just be very, very cautious. When you have low water, even when you're on the trolling motor, you're at a greater risk for going in because of all the stumps that are getting exposed. And what happens is over the years, these trees break off around the surface or near the surface. Then when the lake gets low, they'll break off at that level. So as the lake continues to drop down to pretty close, they're gonna drop it almost to the all-time low. The all-time low is seven and three quarters foot. They're gonna take Lake Fort six for low. As they take it down there, all of the trees that existed in the lake for the most part, are going to be right close to the surface, within a, within two feet of the surface. And a ton of them are going to be out of the surface where you can see them, and a lot of them are going to be right at the surface as we go through this process. So keep that in mind, and please be careful even when you're on your trolling motor. Navigation-wise, hey, if it ain't a white buoy, and you ain't real close to them, and you don't know for sure, don't run. There's plenty of lanes that I run every day out here that I'm having to stop and idle in now because we're at four foot low. Uh, that run going up a little caney is no longer safe. Parts of it are, but you got to know the stretches that are safe and the stretches that aren't. Uh, there, there's definitely some long stretches of that you need to idle at this point. So please be careful on these lakes when you're navigating it. And when in doubt, just idle it out, man. That's the deal. Um, but it's not all doom and gloom when the lake gets low. I remember the last time the lake got really low for a long time at Lake Fork was 2011. It got down to seven and three quarters foot low. And it stayed that way till was it 14 when it came back up? 2014 when it came back up? Um, if you talk to the guys that kind of know what they're doing around the lake, some of the best fishing they've ever experienced happened when the lake was low. It's a very simple principle. We overthink things. And I hear a lot of people talk about, oh man, when the lake's low, there ain't nothing to fish. Well, no, there's not flooded vegetation on the bank anymore, guys. There's not. And at four foot low, all the grass in Lake Fork is basically dead. All the hydrilla and kingtail is gone. Forget about that. It's over. That ain't coming back this year. Okay, uh, so that's not there to fish. But what you gotta really concentrate on and remember is that those fish didn't die. The fish that live in the top four foot of the water column didn't drown from air because they dropped the lake four foot. They swam back into the, they pulled back off the bank and stayed in the water, right? We all know that. Well, all that does is take the same amount of fish and put them in less space, okay? It's like a cereal bowl, man. When you get to the end, there's just a cereal floating around all that milk, it's kinda hard to catch them. But when you crowd all that cereal in there together, you can get a bunch of them at once, right? <laughs> Same deal with these fish. Just think about it like that. This lake dropping six foot is going to condense a lot of these fish into uh, similar areas. And it's really going to pull fish out of the backs of creeks, off the bank. Not only will it do, do that because there's less water there, during the winter time with no grass being in the lake, it's going to eliminate that bite. A lot of our fish will stay shallow in the winter time and live in vegetation. 
Well, now they don't have vegetation throughout this winter, so where the, what are they going to do? They're not just going to stay up there in one foot of water on the bank with nothing to, nothing to live in, nothing to hang out on. I mean, a couple of dumb ones will, you know. But most of those fish that would have lived in grass are also going to go further out to the main lake, down into creek channel bins, you know, stuff like that, points, whatever. So it's going to condense the fish big time. And it's actually, if you keep an open mind and you don't get spun, about, spun out about there's nothing visually to fish on the bank, uh, it can be a very, very productive time of year because when you find them, you will often find a lot of them when the lakes start getting as low as this lake's about to get. So my first piece of advice to you guys for fishing low water conditions is don't freak out. Take the conditions of the day in, take the conditions of the lake in, and let's go fishing because we got more of them in less space. So if we can find them, we're going to catch them. So just don't get mentally spun out about the lake being low is my first piece of advice for fishing low lake levels. Heath and David, either one of y'all chime in. Tell me some low lake advice. <clears throat> well, the <coughs> back in the years when the lake was extremely low, there were some patterns that just absolutely were off the chart. I mean, we had some, some 18, 19, 20 foot deep uh, places at the mouths of creeks, mouths at the major, right at the the inlets to go into like a Wolf Creek or a Dale or or Little Caney or whatever the case, and those fish would pile up out there at the mouth. And these places that, I know one in particular place that had a peninsula uh, that was never ever noticed before when the lakes, when that's 28 foot of water at the top of that peninsula, but when that water came down, that was all of a sudden in 20 foot, and I mean to tell you it was a magnet. They yeah. stacked up on it, and we just wrenched on them every day on that spot. It was almost like they kept filling up, filling up, filling up. That was on days where it was uh, more sunshine and days that were calmer that we could get out there on main lake stuff and fish that kind of stuff. Now, when you got a cold front coming through like it was, uh, like it will be tomorrow, and then you know uh, where tomorrow the water's morning, yeah. tomorrow morning, it's going to start. The temps are going to start to drop. As that water drops, the creeks itself are going to provide an insane target to throw at, and that's these giant trees that are on the edges of these creeks and some of the biggest, biggest bass that you'll catch. Uh, I remember the late Mark Pack used to always live up at Garrett Creek along the edge of that creek following it all the way up as far as he could go and they were flipping black and blue jigs on those giant stumps up there and count, count the number 11, 12s that they caught over the years doing that type of thing. That, that goes into the condensing them and funneling them down because as fish yeah. get condensed and funnel down the lowest water they can go to is in, the, in that creek bend, right? And their ambush points to feed when they're in those bo bottoms of those creeks is right on the edges in those root systems around those stumps that are on the edge of the creek. So that is one of the things that just goes right along with those fish getting condensed. More of them are, even more of them will be in that creek channel. And when it gets cold like he's talking about, that's going to put even well, more of them in that creek channel. $64 question on that is why are those fish on those trees? And I'm going to go with the common sense route in the fact that you got the big stump that's exposed. And on the sunny days, does that, that sun actually heat that tree up enough that could transmit some of that down into the water? Maybe, maybe not. But all those fish have a tendency that big fish get up on that type, on that wood. And that's been a, a great pattern for a long, long time when the water was low. And then also, too, and I was noticing driving over these bridges a while ago, what do you notice that stands out like a sore thumb right now is all the tree, what, lines. It's just timber lines you can see now. Now, you'll drive around this lake, and you'll see timber lines everywhere. Do not hesitate for a moment to throw a square bill. Leave it if it's, if it's four foot, five foot, six foot, eight foot, whatever it is, throw a square bill on those tree lines. And that's a pattern that will, you know, serve a great purpose at some point in time. And, uh, I mean, kinda, God, in the past years, we just train right kinda on it. functions like a grass line does. Well, like you're, you're like Lake Welsh, Lake where mm -hmm. you fish all the time. It, it's really pretty devoid of structure for the most part as far as bottom contours. A lot of it's the same on bottom contours. A lot of the points don't really run out. They just kind of fall off quick. So there's not a lot of really good bottom contour structure to fish on Welsh. But those grass lines create points that you fish on Welsh a lot. Well, these tree lines kind of can function the same way when there's no grass in the lake. And one of the, one of the things, you know, not just, I'm sure it happens before, but I grew up fishing cypress, sandland. Yeah. Uh, whenever they would drop down and get low, uh, and there was no, you know, you don't have to worry about fishing docks usually because they're out of the water. Most docks out of the water, right. right. But uh, if, if there are shallow fish, a lot of them will be on that first break line. Mm -hmm. you know, there'll, there'll be a break line out, you know, where it kind of drops off a little bit. 
sometimes they'll hang on that and be on nothing else if they're shallow. But another thing that I always fish, you know, growing up when sandlin would get really low, uh, seems like when the lake is full, the underwater bridges are just a little too deep. But when the when the lake would drop, you know, five six foot low, it would put that those underwater bridges and those creeks where the underwater bridges go. At the it would put them exactly yeah. at the right depth, and yeah. you, could, you could go out there and, and kill them. And now with live sonar, you can really fish underwater bridges boy, a lot, fish, yeah. a lot more effectively yeah, than you could in years no past. Used to, we would just graph them, see if there was fish, you know, sitting, sitting up on top of there. Yeah. And you couldn't yeah. see the fish that were maybe to the side of the bridge or under the bridge. Now you could you could drop a your live scope down there, you know, any live sonar, and you'll be able to see the fish swimming around the right. guardrails because that's what they would do on sandlin. They would get out there on the guardrails, and they've done it before yeah. here. Maze has told a story here. a couple times where he was fishing a kind of a mid depth roadbed old bridge in the summertime, and he would throw his, his he'd drive over to Martin no fish, throw his Carolina rig or big shaggy head or whatever on there, and he'd start dragging that thing and it's kind of ticking along the roadbed. And, on live sonar, he could watch them swim out in front of that bridge and come up on top mm -hmm. of the road, but look at his bait. Yeah, so. they can hear it bang, what? banging on that on yeah. the concrete. You know, we used to throw deep diving crankbaits because back back then, when the lake was full, you couldn't get a, of course, that was back before 10 XD, and we couldn't get a 6 XD or a, or a DD22 down to it. But once it, the lake would drop, we could reach it then. Start to. And if you could get your bill to hit that concrete right, right, right alongside of those, those guardrails, no you could catch them. No doubt. That's if you ain't banging, you ain't cranking. Mm -hmm. One thing I've noticed from both of these two gentlemen that, like I said, a lifetime of experience between these two guys fishing in East Texas, one thing they both said, and, and they didn't exactly say it, but if you were listening close, both of them said this. New areas. When the lake gets low, it puts new areas that you don't ever fish in the right depth. Because we all think about, well, what depth are we fishing? Are we fishing, you know, five foot and less? Are we fishing kind of five foot to 12 foot, which is kind of mid depth around here in East Texas? Or are we fishing 15, 20 foot and deeper? You know, we're all thinking about what's the key depth. I mean, that's in every fishing report you read. It's, it's a very important component to think about. Well, when you take six foot of water off a lake, if you're supposed to be fishing stuff that's in 20 foot of water, well, now that's normally stuff that's in 26 foot of water, which we don't fish 26 foot of water a whole lot on lake for it. I mean, when you're fishing deep, a lot of times it's 20. I mean, there is moments when you fish 26 foot of water but it's not just all the time, right? Uh, or even say if you want to fish in the wintertime, you want to fish 25 foot of water. Well now at regular lake levels, that would have been 31 foot. When we get to six foot low, it's gonna be 25 foot. So especially 30 foot of water, we don't fish. There's new areas that get brought into play and they're wide open guys. They're not community holes because it's new stuff that nobody fishes. So there's an opportunity when that lake is low to get out there and find stuff that's very untapped that you can actually for once on Lake Fork have something to yourself until the next day when somebody sees you fishing on it and then, then you're done. But but for a day you can have something to yourself, you know. And that's so rare out here and it, it provides an opportunity when Lake gets low to find new areas that'll produce for you because that point that extends out that's just too deep most of the time is now in the right depth or the bridge like Heath is talking about. Either way, new areas, both of them mentioned it. Well you can't also rule out the possibility for the tournament guys in here the people that fish stringer tournaments on this lake, uh, which I did it for years and years and years here, so I finally got narrowed down. Uh, in January, for many years, there was some, there was three spots that I had here on this lake for catching unders for the stringer tournaments, and I'd start the day in 28 foot of water, and I fish all the way out to 37 foot. Caught all those fish between 28 and 37 foot here. And, and won two weekends back to back, two, two stringer tournaments back to back, all of them came out of that depth. And so what you have to do with those fish is instead of needling them, I don't want to kill them, I would get the fin clips and hook the fin clips on the back of their uh, the fin, the rear fin, to where they would set up right in the live well. And then that would keep them alive enough to where we could get them back in the water and they would survive. So. There, like you said, the new water that comes available is priceless. And now you just got to take more time, spend more time on the water in order to discover these spots and really get outside your comfort level and look for something that you've never ever looked at before. Yep. Any other low water advice there, Heath? Just, it narrows down your decision making process. It eliminates, mm -hmm. it eliminates the techniques, doesn't it? That's mm -hmm. what I was kind of going to go to next. You know, it's going to... It's probably going to take away some of the frog fishing in the springtime. Um, it's definitely going to take away uh, the chatterbait and, and lipless crankbait bite that we can normally do throughout the entire winter. That's going to go away. 
Um, That's gonna kill you, ain't it? <laughs> no, <laughs> not a bit. I listen. I I do. So here's what happens when I go out and film videos. I've got to go out and get some bikes. Because who's gonna watch a video of my ugly butt standing there doing nothing? For well, I've just heard you as a chatterbait king. Yeah, well, I, because I've a chatterbait is a bait that I can go get around grass, throw a chatterbait, I can get bit. Like I can. So when I go out on filming days, I'm very rarely am I going. You know what? We're going. We're gonna try and catch the biggest one in the pond today. Most of the time I'm going out going, man, we gotta get some bites today. And a chatterbait is a bait that I feel, for me personally, I'm really confident if I got grass, I can take chatterbait around grass and get bit. So I'll fish a lot on camera. Lo and behold, chatterbait's a good good bait that catches big fish. We'll go ahead and catch some big ones on that when we're filming. And so people see me on camera catching a lot of fish on chatterbait, catching big fish on chatterbait. People see me fish shallow a lot on camera because since we started filming five years ago, the lake's been full. Lake's been full and we've had grass. So I've been fishing shallow a lot. And it's pretty easy when you get around that grass to feel confident and be a little more safer in your decision making that I'm going to get some bites today. But that's a misconception. Because I started fishing this lake in 2010. It was at an all time low in 2011. I personally prefer to fish out off the bank on Lake Floyd. Now, with the advancement of modern electronics, the lake at full pool for so many years, the spots that th those fish gather on have become harder and harder to find that aren't just beat the heck and back. What has happened with the advancement of modern electronics, and you talk to tour pros, they'll say this too, and if you pay attention to the, the top level tours, there's a lot more tournaments getting one shallow now than deep. Because what's happened with all these modern electronics, the community holes have become the deep stuff that nobody used to fish. Back in the day, if you were an offshore structure fisherman, boy, you had it figured out. Not a lot of people did that. Everybody pretty much fished shallow. Now with new electronics, everybody fishes deep. And these things, these contour lines, mapping, all that stuff is advanced as well. Everybody can find points and row beds and humps and creek channels. We can all find that now. So that stuff is just getting beat up. Hey, boys. <laughs> Shh, quiet down. That stuff is all getting beat up. And lost my train of thought getting, getting frustrated with kids. <laughs> <laughs> And so, <clears throat> so what's happened is the shallow water has become kind of the more unused water for the most part. But now that those fish are going to get condensed and some new areas are going to come into play, I'm actually extremely excited about the lake being low. In fact, what's funny is Zach Watts, many of you guys know Zach Watts, he's my best friend and business partner of mine. He actually texted me when the announcement came out that they were going to drop Lake Fork six foot low. His text to me was, looks like you're going to get your wish. I don't know what he's talking about. I go, what do you mean? He goes, they're going to drop the lake. Because just a couple weeks before that, I go, the lake was already getting low. I go, man, I sure wish this lake would just go on and get like 8 or 10 foot low. Like, just drop it down to like 10 foot low and leave it there. I, I probably have said it on camera. I probably have said it on camera. So, no, I'm not disappointed that the lake's going to be low. I'm not sad that I'm not going to throw a chatterbait in the trap all winter. I'm relishing the opportunity to have more fish in new areas and more fish in some of the old areas and be able to simplify, as Heath just said, Simplify my decision making. One thing I love about winter fishing, if you're going to fish off the bank, you're going to not fish shallow, it's real simple. Bring you a jig, bring you a jerk bait, bring you an Alabama rig. I mean, you don't need much else. Like you can pretty well get by every day in the wintertime with them three things if you're not fishing around shallow grass. If you are going to fish shallow grass in the wintertime, bring you a chatterbait, bring you a trap, bring you a sinko. Like it's really simple decision making in the winter. With the lake being low, it's going to make it even that much more simple. So, I don't really know this. That's why I'm asking. So, a chatterbait is really around, good around grass. It, it shines around. It's best around grass. Not to say you don't get bit on. I mean, I've gone. Shallow, you go to just shallow. If there's not grass I, music. I've gone to two West Texas, or a Central Texas and a West Texas lake over the last month, month and a half. Stuff that I've never really, types of lakes I've never really fished before, and been around no grass at all, and caught fish on chatterbaits. So, it works without chatter, without grass, but it definitely is shines the best in grass. And I, I feel like in the winter time, with no grass, you're gonna have to get a little deeper. You know, we've been fishing those kind of in the fall, those chatterbaits in the fall, and fish are shallow. Now the fish are gonna start transitioning deeper if we can ever get cold enough to make most of those fish go deeper. That chatterbait's gonna kind of go out of play for me for a while. Well, I got a tackle box full of chatterbaits. I got one more, more thing before I call Cody in. <laughs> Okay. I have one more thing before I get called Cody Mays up here. Um, 
this is the greatest opportunity for you guys that have boats to, learn the lake. to to take your boat and go into places now that I, and I'm doing this next week. I'm gonna take one entire day and I'm gonna run into every creek on this lake and I'm gonna lay me a new trail in there. I'm gonna take out those other trails and I'm gonna find out a, a better way in there so that when the water comes back up, I can idle faster back into some of these creeks without running over the stumps like this, all right? So this is a great opportunity for that. When the water goes to six foot low, then I'm gonna lay the trails out on the main lake in the, the more in the deeper water because I do know there is places on this lake, especially over there around Bird Island and we cut across to go to certain areas over there that there are three or four giant stumps that will come into play here when the water is six foot low, and they're and they're not going to show. They're going to be this, one at, They're going to be this far under the water at six foot low. There, there's one right outside of the main boat lane, right over here, out in front of that moxie pocket, straight across. Yep. Right, and it's just on the right side of the main boat lane. Normally, you can run basically between almost the bank, you know, a little bit out from the bank to the boat lane is wide open over there, and guys running all the time. There's one stump that's going to pop back yep. up over there when yep. we get to six. And right when you go out of this marina out. here and turn to the right, running towards Mustang, out there in the very middle where we've run that wide open for years and years, there's a half a dozen of them out yeah. there that are right in that run. Yeah. And in so the, in the boat run, in the boat run, absolutely. I've got them marked already. That's what scares me on my that. graph my now. And those things, I don't remember if it's well, seven, thing, seven and a half foot for them to become visible. The uh, the the Lance Vic boat lanes. Yeah. One, one thing that's good about that is it comes with downloaded skull and crossbone waypoints on it that are marking trees near boat runs. So he, he's putting those on there so you know, like when the lake starts dropping, hey, you need to start watching for this stump right here. Uh, so I think it's Boat Lanes LLC. Something like that, yeah. He did is it Cody Mays lake. over there? Was All right, so big thank you to David and uh, Heath Taylor for talking to us tonight. Thank y'all. And now we got... Cody Mays and Court Hutkins. Now these are two guys. <clears throat> Cody fished the lake his whole life. He's growing up right here, but he's new to guiding out here. Cord is actually reasonably new to Lake Fork in general. I mean, he guides out here, so he's fished here a lot. But hey, I want to shake his hand real quick for because my son has just been talking about him all the time. <laughs> <laughs> he put him on an eight pounder, and he, oh yeah, he, he's oh okay, you're right just now. that okay, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Cord, yeah. Cord will do that, and he's one of our. As David is as well, Cord and, and Cody are two of our. Really good guides that we work with at Your Lake Fort Guide, and you can visit yourlakefortguide.com to book trips with us, whatever. Uh, we got a bunch of other guys we work with as well that just don't, they look camera shy. They just kind of stay behind the scenes. We work with them as well. And they're all really, I don't work with guys I don't believe in, that's for sure. But Cord has got a, an interesting perspective because of, of most of the guys around here, Cord, even the other guides, like all the guides on the lake, unless you're talking about Lee. Lee Livesey, who travels with the Bassmaster Elite Series. And there's maybe a couple other guys that'll travel a little bit to fish tournaments. But I don't know of any of them that travel around the region and around the country as much as this guy does to fish tournaments. So I'm interested to hear his perspective because he's seen different types of lakes, all, ver all varieties of lakes in low water conditions. Um, Corp, do you have anything you want to touch on for low water conditions, man, that can kind of help, help people out? Low water. I love and hate low water. Right. Most of the time I like it. It'll really, it'll put them in certain spots a lot of times. It'll group them up a little bit better, and especially if you put any kind of current in the lake. If any, any kind of a river system or, you know, lakes that run a lot of current through there, it'll really position them up a lot. And usually it'll... Low water is usually dirtier water in a lot of instances from what I've seen and gathered sure. and it'll help keep them shallow. Well, let's talk about that for a second. So when you get low water conditions, we talked about how it takes a lot of grass out of the lake. Sometimes it takes all the grass out of the lake. Mm -hmm. When you don't have any grass in the lake, <laughs> man, that grass filters a lot of dirt content out of the water. So when you eliminate grass from a lake, it's going to make the water get dirty. Well, yeah, that and just like even your lakes that are typically clean like non-grass lakes like you know i'm from oklahoma and not a whole lot of grass in any of our lakes we got sticks and rocks right and red mud so everything's dirty anyways but a few of the cleaner lakes back home when it starts to drop it just stirs up the lake and all your good bank stuff that they were on or all their points you know where they were used to having you know even like your offshore stuff i feel like it scatters them out and they'll feel more stable closer to the bank because they can relate a lot more to the bank you know because 
they were so used to having 15 foot of water over their head where you jerk 10 foot of water out or five yeah. foot of water out it messes with them they're like this is supposed to be my safety net this supposed to be my safe spot so then they'll go to your docks or your like rip rap points and stuff to where they can move up and down them a lot more and it'll put them on like your steeper banks you know when you yeah. have low water the steeper banks really really excel so, at any time of year that's a good point right there that's mm -hmm. something to look for guys is areas where these fish can transition vertically in the water column mm -hmm. without moving horizontally very much so ledges creek beds that come up close to the bank an area where those fish can go from one foot of water to 10 foot of water or from 10 foot of water to 25 foot of water yep. Uh, it can be any of those things, but those drop-offs, those those ledges, those break lines, where it goes from a certain depth to a deeper depth real abruptly, that's going to be a key thing to look for because as that lake pulls, just like what course talking about, those fish are going to move to those areas to feel safer, mm -hmm. especially when they're pulling. Like this lake right here is the most stable big lake you'll ever find because it's the biggest lake with no river. So our water doesn't fluctuate up or down very much at all compared to other lakes and forth. But now that they're pulling water, which they never do, to work on the dam. These lake fork bass are going to react in a more extreme manner because in their world, that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So for them to pull a foot of water from the lake in a week, I i don't know this lake's ever dropped a foot in a week, ever in the history of it until this week. Yeah. So these fish are in shock. Like they're going to suck out and get in those, those transition areas where they can get deep quick when they need to. I bet it dropped it foot, did not it? Well, they, they're dropping it a foot a week for three weeks until they get to six foot low, and this was the first week of that. I, mean, I was just judging by the bank. How far yeah, well, it's, so it's, it was at three foot low when they started that process, so we're at about four foot low now, or we should be. Um, but it dropped gradually to three feet low over the whole fall, summer, summer, summer and fall and all that, and then they dropped a foot in a week, which just doesn't ever happen. But when you have like, you know, you're talking about dropping it that fast and these fish react like that. You drop water that fast because I've been in situations to where the lake was up, you know, spring floods. Well, as soon as that water tops out and then they're like, all right, we got to let it out. They're getting it out of there as fast as they can. A lot of times they get it back normal in case, you know, especially in the springtime. They get another rain. You'll, you'll have another rain. So if you let, you know, you'll get three or four foot of water in the lake. You let it sit too long without getting it out, you'll screw around. And you'll have another three or four foot on top of that. So a lot of times I fish a lot of tournaments. Oklahoma is the world's worst, I feel like. Lakes will run up. And they'll get high and muddy and they'll still be cold and then they'll jerk it down and those fish are really bad about suspending and they shut their mouths and they will not i mean it makes them really really tough when you to get catch. cold muddy water that's about as tough as it so uh, tough same instance like you used to uh, fish the delta in california mm -hmm. high and low tide high yeah, tide the fish was just outstanding yep. as soon as it went low they yep. shut their mouths yeah. yeah. How long will it get the fish lock jaw when this water is receded like what it is? So it just needs to stabilize. Like these next few weeks, while it's changes so much, mm -hmm. the fish are probably going to not bite as good. Yeah. Right. While well, that's after, you give it about another week after that, and it stabilizes, and those fish will kind of settle into their new routine, mm -hmm. and they'll bite better. Now, that being said, doesn't mean they're not catchable because of them dropping that water, like we've been talking about, it's going to condense them. It's going to put groups of them in the same areas. So if you go out there and you get one to bite, you're probably going to be around a bunch and they're probably going to start biting. So it's still a very obtainable thing to catch them. Like, that's the big thing about Lake Fork. Like, man, when they open the gates, they don't bite. I don't buy into that. I, what I buy into is when they pull current on this lake, it repositions fish, and we're used to fishing this lake with no current 99% of the time. Mm -hmm. So when they pull current the fish reposition, we're, most of the guys on this lake, myself included, for the most part, I like to think of myself as one of the more open-minded guys, but... When you fish this lake all the time like we do, for the most part, we go out there and we run the same stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we've been running the same stuff. We've been catching them every day, five days in a row. We've been catching them on this, this area, these, this milk run of areas, right? Then they open the gates, repositions our fish. We go through our milk run and go, where'd our fish go? Well, they just reposition, but you're so set in your ways and you've been catching them there five days in a row, you won't adjust until... A couple days later, you'll finally start looking around, and then you'll catch them again. And I've had plenty of days with the gates open where I've caught fish plenty good. Current does not stop fish from biting. Water dropping does not stop fish from biting. In an extreme case of change, it will at times make fish go into a shock mode and not want to bite a little bit. So this extreme, what we're doing now, yeah, there's going to be a little bit of that. But don't buy into the myth that fish ain't going to bite because the gates are open on Lake Fork. That's not true. They're just on the move constantly. you got to move with them. you got to like relocate them. <clears throat> and in a lake like this that is so full of cover 
even with no grass, there's timber everywhere you look for the most part. I mean, those fish, when they reposition, may pull off that point and go suspend on that timber 50 yards out there, and you might not ever see them. You might not ever make a cast out of them. So it can be tough to find them, I think, more so when they're pulling current than it is tough to catch them. Cody, what you got for low water? Well, I'm going to be honest. So in 2012, when it was low, <clears throat> I was actually on the road working uh, as a welder. So this is actually going to be the first time I've actually fished fork when it's going to be this low. Be this low. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I fish other lakes when it's low, but... All right, well, you be quiet now. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I, I can tell you what I'm doing right now is, as far as current conditions, as it's dropping and stuff like that. Um, you know, we've been catching them in, in treetops that are actually exposed now. Uh, they're suspended. You're throwing a, I'm throwing a big old uh, spinnerbait with a big old uh, Colorado uh, dumper blade, dumper blade, uh, jerk bait, and then also whenever that's kind of slows down, well, which you know I've got live scope as well. So um, if they're not suspended and they're hovering down around the bottom of this wood, then then that's when I'm throwing a jig or a Texas rig or or drop shot. Um, and then also, like they said, you know, if y'all have watched me on videos with Billy, my thing is road beds, ledges, and pond down. That's my favorite thing to fish. Uh, so right now with the lake coming down, there's going to be a lot more of them that, you know, is, is not as deep that, you know, that I typically wouldn't fish in the past. Um, so they're going to set up on these channels in these swings where these ledges are. And that's, and that's where I'm fishing right now. Also with structure... You know, brush piles, uh, timber, tire reefs that's down in you know in these in these swings um, with drop shot and uh, black and blue finesse jig. That right now is what I've been catching them on quite a bit. Uh, five sixteenths or even seven sixteenths, six cents ball head finesse jig with the black and blue stroker crawl. Uh, cut in half on that. That yes. way it kind of you know makes the profile a little bit smaller. Six cents uh, and Santone make those finesse jigs. You got those big. Heavy gauge hooks in them, so you can still fish. It's a finesse jig ball head, which is great in the wintertime. It's lighter, smaller profile, which is great. Uh, but you can go ahead and fish them like a jig, as far as how you set the hook on them, the rod, and throw them on. How you handle fish, it's good to have that to get those fish out of that junk. Because you, if you hang a fish up in them root systems, pretty much done. Yep. That deal's pretty much over then. So, um, yeah, it's great to be able to throw those finesse jigs, and I have to worry about you know for years we just had light wire hooks. Yeah. But six cents makes that one now. It's got that big heavy heavy gauge hook on. Mm -hmm. But you know, right now a lot of the fish that I am seeing they're all suspended. It's like they're a lot still of fish are suspended. They're, right. they're stuck in transition. I, I think and you can tell me if you disagree or agree, or whatever. I think that that's because we had warmer weather. Mm -hmm. Like the water temps have stayed within a few degrees of sixty for like months now, a couple like a month or two at least. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and I think what happened is when it started and got down to that sixty mark, those fish started to go, okay, the fall deal is kind of done. You know, as far as running, running up on the bank, feeding on Chad in the back of the creek, and they kind of pulled out, and then it just stayed there, and they just kind of dispersed mm -hmm. and suspended in these trees. And there was another time when that happened. It was last November. Usually, this deal kind of wraps up in December. We get cold enough, it drops that water temperature down to the low 50s. When that happens, fish start getting to the bottom of these creek bends, start doing their main lake thing, all that, road beds, all that. Mm -hmm. Well, we stayed around 60, just like we were last November. Y'all remember the Elite Series, November 2020? What was Patrick Walter doing? Catching fish and spinning in trees, right? Looking at the Moscow. Mm -hmm. Kind of open the whole fishing world to that deal. So that deal has been happening. And, and for me, the best way to catch them right now is to look at them on live. I mean, they, it's the time of year to do it. They're slowing down. The water temps are cooling off, so the fish are moving around less. In the summertime, keeping a bass on a live scope is one of the hardest things you'll ever do. They just never stop moving. It's hard to keep that bass on your screen. And this time of year and in the wintertime, those fish will not move as fast, they won't move as much. They'll get around a tree and kind of stay there. And so that deal is, is wide open right now. Like if you have a lot of sonar and you want to learn it, you need to be doing it right now. And you need to be throwing a big blade of spinner baits is a great way to go about it too, because that will kind of hang in their face a little bit and slow roll it and all that. But those jerk baits, suspended jerk baits, Alabama rigs, all those are great for looking at fish on live sonar and catching them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, so, the summary of the low water deal, guys, it, 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 we've sat up here and talked and talked and talked about it in great detail, which we love to do. We like to give you guys everything we got. And I hold, you know, for so many years in fishing, guys have been like, give me some fishing tips. Oh, you go throw a black and blue jig. And that was it. That's the whole tip right there. But we like to give you all the details because we've all been that guy that's just learning. We've all been that guy that works. All three of us have recently been that guy that's working five or six days a week and gets one chance a week to fish. So we want to help you as much as we can by giving you every 
tip or secret or piece of knowledge that we got. Um, but this low water fishing, simple it down and comes to this. These are what you need to remember. These are the bullet points you need to take with you. Be extra cautious in East Texas because we got all these stuffs. Be open minded and look for new water because new stuff is going to play. Right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is going to simplify. It's going to eliminate a lot of water. It's going to eliminate a lot of baits. If you go out for this winter, right now, if you start right now and go forward and you carry you a jerk bait, an Alabama rig, and a jig, <clears throat> guys, you can catch them every day on one of those three baits from now till they start moving up to spawn. Mm -hmm. You can catch them on those one of those three baits every day. A jerk bait, an Alabama rig, and a jig. So it's that simple. I mean, it really is that simple. With with the water being low, it takes away a lot of options. It simplifies things down. The water getting colder, it, it takes it takes away ways to catch them. It makes things easy as far as making your decisions. Now it's just about going and finding fish and fishing efficiently and effective enough to get them to bite. Well, another thing about the you know the winter. So with live scope, you can see the fish. You know they're there. Um, you know, if you're going by and you're side scanning, you see the fish, they're not, they're, they're going to be there. Just, you know, just be patient. Because in the winter, I had I look at it a lot like bed fishing. You're going to sit there on that bed fish, and you're going to agitate that fish so much until she bites. And to me, in the winter, it's the same way. You've got to get that fish active or aggravated enough, put it in its face enough times for it to say, I'm about to eat this dang thing. Mm -hmm. you yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, Good so point. Just stay patient. That's the main thing. Yeah, yeah, you gotta be thorough with them. Yeah. You gotta be thorough with them. Uh, you know, like, also right now we have a lot of wind. It's gonna be like spring. We're gonna have wind out of the north, we're gonna have it out of the south. I mean, it's just, it's gonna be coming from all different directions. Depending on which side of the front you're on. Yeah. Really. <clears throat> so, you know, you say be patient, but how long do you chunk at one? If you see him down there and he ain't biting, you, you know, I mean, when do you find it? So I better go find one somewhere else. Well, depends on the technique. Yeah. Depends on a few things. Mm -hmm. So it depends Time on the technique. a lot of it too. Mm -hmm. I feel like, especially this lake. This one, one thing being a newer guy than y'all, timing on this lake Big deal. is a huge deal. I don't know how many times I've drove over a brush pile mm -hmm. and it's be loaded to the gills, and I'm like, oh, I'm about to load the boat, <laughs> sit there for an hour, and not get a nibble, and be like, this don't make sense. I go fish around for two, three hours, come back, make one cast, and boom, and then the next cast, boom, and yeah. then I'm like, that don't yeah. make no sense. I can come back the next day at the right time. And they won't bite, but I come back another two hours early, like earlier, and they'll start biting again. It's just like we kind of saw something like that on Ivy too. A lot of it, yeah. Yeah. So when we were on Ivy, one of the places we caught some fish was on this this river bend bank. They had like the main river, the Colorado River, swung up against this bank for about 50, 75 yards, 100 yards to yeah. look at. And uh, the first day we went in there late in the day, right in like two, three, four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. About three o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. Three o'clock in the afternoon. We went in there, and it was. One after another, one you know, after another. Cord started getting some bites pretty quick on that bank. And uh, the next day we were fishing. We cruised by there in the morning, didn't get a bite. No. After about five, ten minutes of fishing it with no bites, I said, scratch this, let's go somewhere else. We're coming back here this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Come back two or three o'clock in the afternoon, bite, um, bite, bite. Like, yeah. The timing is such a big deal in this game. Mm -hmm. over and especially coming in this time of year, especially <laughs> when the water hits the 50s, which it should probably here pretty soon i feel like uh, i with think the well it's going to for sure get into the 50s after tomorrow yeah because it's front blowing in overnight tonight yeah but you know once those fish are used to that 50 degree water temp and if it kind of stabilizes through that for a little while then you start getting you know after the new year the, the days will get a little bit longer and then whenever you have that day like today where it gets up in the 60s or 70s and a little bit of a warm south breeze or whatever those fish in the afternoons like in the morning when you hit the lake the water tent might be 53, 54. It might be pretty tough, and you're like, I'm gonna put it on the trailer at noon. If you just hang out until that, let, let, let that water warm up just a little mm -hmm. bit, if you find those nice transition spots to where a good channel swing to where it might be 15, 20 foot of water, but then you've got a nice, like, five to eight foot flat, those fish will get up and they'll roam those flats. And a lot of times, they might even be chasing bait, they're just up there sunning. They're just like, you know what, man, this feels yeah. good. You know, yeah. I've, been, I've been cold all damn day. I'm gonna get up here and you know, just swim around and like you'll, you know, I've done it a bunch, especially as we get a little bit closer to spring, but even in the winter time, you know, even if it's a bluebird day, it might be post front, those fish will still want to get out and they'll want to get up and sun a little bit. You know, I'm like, I'm not saying you're going to go catch them fast and furious, you know, like you would in the fall or late spring, but 
you'll get a few more bites, you know, if you look for those areas and keep keep rotating through there because you might graph them, you, you know, you might graph that ledge or that creek bend and those fish will be buried down there in the bottom and you'll throw that jig. Yeah, you might pluck one or two of them, but you're like, man, there's a lot of fish there. I feel like you get a bit more drive back by in the afternoon and those fish are either up suspended higher in the water column or they'll be moved up on top a lot of you know, times. It's funny you said that about the sun. And, so my, my granddaddy used to be a guide out here back in the early 90s and he always told me that if the turtles are sunning, the fish are sunning. So, <laughs> you know, and I, and I believe that. Yeah. Um, but so also with these winds, what I was going to say a minute ago, um, what you can do, like we'll use birch for an instance. It runs north and south. So if you got you a south wind, north wind, whatever. As the wind's coming out of the south, you're on the north side of the bridge, right up against that skirting, it's going to have a little bit of a current through there. And these... Oh. You had one of them Asian ladybug beetles on you. Oh. He flew off. <laughs> so you're going to have this current coming through this, this bridge right there at the skirting. And I've noticed in the last couple of weeks, you can sit back on the side of that bridge and throw towards that the opening of the skirt and the first piling and pluck you some fish out of there and you're out of the wind you know and it because you know sometimes you you get fed up i mean you're out there and that winds is crazy mm -hmm. strong and you're like i gotta get out of the wind for a little bit you know yeah. so, right <laughs> especially if you're trying to use life solar on the wind boy that's about as big of a hit eh? <laughs> do one more quick tip then we'll do some more giveaways uh something that i've been just experimenting with and learning. I've been experimenting with the live sonar. You guys have seen it on some of the videos. We've been using it more and more. But uh, a tip on that, we use that Alabama rig a lot. We use jerk bait a lot. Those are, those are very prominent baits on that, using that live sonar. Keeping that bait further above that fish than what you think you need to is a big deal. So when you throw that out, if you've got live sonar, you throw an Alabama rig out there and you're reeling it, and you see your Alabama, you see one down below it, and he starts to come up, a lot of times I would drop the bait to get down by the fish and then when it got close to them I'd start reeling it again. You know, try to make that sudden change of direction, make that fish bite. Never works. Never works. If they bite, it's after I've been reeling it for a while and they swim behind and eat it. If, when, that, when that fish starts to come up to look at your bait from way beneath it, sometimes 10 foot, 15 foot below it, maybe longer, more than that depending on what lake you're at, how deep you are. When he starts to move up towards it, don't drop it. Just pause it. Just hold your rod straight up in the air and just let that Alabama rig sit there and hover. It'll just kind of glide. Don't worry about the tail's not kicking. Don't worry about it. Just let it sit there and glide and hold that bait above that fish. It's like the further they have to swim to come up to it, the more committed they are and the more likely they're going to eat it. Mm -hmm. So if they're swimming from a couple feet below it, they might swim up, take a look, and then go back down. They might come up, do it again, go back down. If they're down there 10 foot below and they swim up to it, they're going to bite it. I mean, every time. Like every time. That is a very key thing that I have found out on that live sonar. Whatever bait it is, you jerk bait or whatever. When they start to swim up to it, just let it sit there. Let them come up to it. Now, if they come up to it, just sit there. Well, now you got to do something. You got to shake it. You got to reel it. Twitch jerk bait. You got to do something if they just sit there and it's sitting still. But that Alabama will almost hover and suspend. I mean, it might glide down a little bit, but it almost stops right above their head. So keep that bait. Don't be scared to keep that bait further above the fish than what you need to. Never get it below them. Always keep it above them. And don't be scared to keep it up well above them and let them come to you. Those fish will travel to come get that thing. Mm -hmm. All right, let's do some more giveaways. Let me slide over here so I can show the, the bait boxes to the camera, guys. First, first gift box we got here, this is a, a six cents box through and through. I believe I see one Strike King crankbait in there. But this is a six cents box. It's got, it's kind of a, hodgepodge box. The first two are going to be kind of just a mixed bag. This one's got uh, a few deep diving crankbaits. There's a whopper plopper in here. There's a, like a series five strike king crankbait in there. There's a, a top water bait, a jerk bait, a couple jerk baits, speed glide, square bills, a few square bills, flat side of one. There's a new axle swim jig, the new weedless swim jig, and a regular swim jig. And the bottom row has just a variety of six cents divine swim baits in it. So, a lot of good stuff in that box. Who wants this box? So how we're gonna do this is, if you, you guys gotta stump me in Lake Fork Trivia. If, you, if I get the answer, then you don't get the box. But if you can stump me, you get it. So, just who wants to go first? Who's got a question for me? <coughs> Young Dean, what you got? You've been Googling, haven't you? <laughs> Biggest bluegill ever caught. Biggest bluegill ever caught out of Lake Fork? 
Take your box. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good creative question. I figured that'd what, do you know the answer? Oh, okay. How many you know the answer? Another thing, a uh, very similar box here. We got four or five deep diving crankbaits, square bills, a couple scrounger heads. The new sweet swim bait from Six Senses in here. That's hard to get. There's one of those. Uh, four or five topwaters, another speed glide, and some others. Just a hodgepodge. Hard bait box with some scrounger heads thrown in and one soft swim bait. All right, who's got another question? What's the third largest bass ever caught on Lake Fork? Third largest bass ever caught on Lake Fork. That's going to be Larry Larry Barnes Valentine. That's the right fish, ain't it? That's Larry Barnes Valentine fish is the third largest we caught. Yeah, I got that. I know that one. What did it weigh? 17 something. <laughs> Two part question. Right how many creeks feed Lake Fork? How many major creeks? And then how many secondary creeks? Well, what do we do? Where's the break line at? <laughs> How do we define that? Well, it is a it is a is that a, it is a true a, true question. Is that a data point that they have somewhere? How many major creeks and how many secondary? Creeks? Well, can we? How do we define what's major and what's secondary? Well, Major Creek would be Birch. Well, I know that, yeah. So Major Creeks, we got Lake Fork Creek, Garrett Creek, Elm Creek, Birch Creek. Wolf? No, Wolf? Will Wolf, see, will Wolf be a Major Creek or not? I don't know. No? Okay, no. So then you got Little Caney. Then going down the other side, you got... I'll give you a hint. There's only four Major Creeks. Oh. Well, that's, there's no way. That's uh, Those aren't Major so running creek's not a major running creek's a major creek, right? It's not. Just give it the bag. Give it the bag. Listen, this was this was going under protest. This one's going under protest because I can name every creek on this lake, y'all. Major or minor. Nineteen secondary, four major. So what is something like no name? That's nothing. That's a secondary creek. That's a secondary creek? What's the four main creeks? I'm there's a, there's a lot more than 19. Birch, Caney, Lake Fork, and... Big Caney, which is Oil Will Bay up on east side. Big Caney. Oh, okay. So that's what they're considering a major creek. So that, see, that's confusing. Because see, I would consider Dale Creek a major creek, Rogers Creek a major... Like, those are all big creeks. <coughs> Secondary. You ever seen it? Dale, back of Dale Creek when it rains real hard? That's a major creek, dude. That sucker goes across the road. Uh, oh, no, he goes over one. the road. I looked it up once, and it, that was, I remember, 19 and 4. I need to have an argument with whoever did the data. Yeah. Uh, they need to redefine their major minor creeks. That's somebody that's already. Yeah, yeah, we need to talk to somebody. I got a hog wall of box. This is a ready-to-go box right here. This one's got... Six or seven different colors of hog walla packages in it. It's got a few different hooks and shaky heads and tungsten weights for you to use on hog wallas. Who's got a Who's got a question? Oh. What day? What was the first day that Lake Fort Marina opened? Oh, first day Lake Fort Marina opened. Golly, man, you guys aren't asking any obvious ones. These are I don't have any idea. Take your box. Y'all are kicking my ass. <laughs> I did. I did. You thought they were going to ask about some fishing question. I guarantee you, next, next December, I'm going to do a bunch of research before we do this again. Now, a young lady right here has got one. I'm going to let her ask. Dad, I catch a fish. That's the biggest gander. He can't answer one. That's not like pork question. What'd she say? That's not like pork question. Oh, that's okay. No, you're, you're cheating. You're using your phone. No, no, no. <laughs> Okay, last box we're going to give away. This is the wintertime box. This is the one you want right now. This has got all kinds of winter crankbaits, slipless crankbaits, square bills, that wiggle tight, flat sided ones. It's got wiggle wart, the, well, the curve 55, the new wiggle like wart, six inch bait. Oh, oh, hey, we Shatter got a trailers. Yeah, you got a question back there. No, I'm waiting. Yeah, he's just waiting. Go ahead. He's ready for you. I just want to know how long did Ethel live in captivity in Bass Pro? What year did she pass away? With a thousand people in her field. Oh God, I know. See, I know. I know that. I know that, but I can't. I don't. Let me think for a second. So Please Ethel. Get wrong, I want that box. So, huh? <laughs> so Ethel. Ethel. For those that don't know, was the fish Mark Stevens had caught. It was the first state record out of Lake Fork. Weighed seventeen point six two. Six four. Six seven. Seventeen point six seven pounds. It was the fish that started the share program, which is. 
changed the face of fishing in the state of Texas? In 1986. Not yet. 1986 is when it was caught. It was caught in November on a jig yep. at the intersection of Garrett and Elm Creek. Uh, Come on, God! <laughs> here we go. Um, then Johnny Morris, who's great friends with Mark Stevenson, who caught the fish, who's a Hall of Famer and still guiding out here to this day, Mark Stevenson is. Johnny Morris took the fish to the Bass Pro Shops headquarters, like the flagship store in Springfield, Missouri, and she lived there until 1990. He's, he's googling. <laughs> no, I already know. I already know. 1990. I was, I was there and I just seen it too, and I forgot the I forgot the date. Oh man, she she was there for. Well, for some reason, I got 93 in my head. 96. God dang it, I knew it. Was, was thousand people at her funeral. Thousand people at her funeral. Oh, Come get you, Box Grant. <laughs> my son's coming to get you. <laughs> we got one more. Hold on, we got one more giveaway. Pass that back. I need a rock. I need an Alabama <laughs> Well, my man over here has been trying to get a question in for a while. I know a lot of you guys. Sorry if I don't get to y'all. You were trying to get one in. Go yeah. ahead. Uh, what did Mark Pat catch his biggest bass on on Lake Four? What did Mark Pat catch his biggest bass on Lake Fork? I actually don't know this, but I'm going to guess just on me knowing Pat. Mark Pat, his biggest bass on Lake Fork. That's going to be back in the 90s. So that's going to eliminate some of the baits. I want to say jig. But knowing Pat, man, probably a Carolina rig. He told me it was a Colorado Blade swin uh, spinner bait in uh, December, 18 foot away. Doesn't surprise me. Doesn't surprise me. There you go. I can't remember how big it was, but. I thought he had I want you to know that rod. All this fish right here. Right rod. Rod. I freaking the largest piece. Thank y'all very much. Right here, right here. They're made here. Right What's that now? Right. Say that again. The ones that got these duplicates are this big bass. Yeah. It's both of the float and like yeah. four. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's supposed to be a world record. No, it would have been a state record. The world record is 22 pounds. Yeah. She was like 20, 20 or 21. She was, state. she weighed 19 point. 6'2", I think, when they found her floating, but she had some flesh missing when she was eating, so they estimated her to be 20, 21 pounds. Right. Where did they find this fish? Where did they find it? Yes. Well, it was floating down there on the south end of the lake. Who found it? I don't know. Some old guy that's in a picture at Oak Ridge Marina. Oh. Did he get sent to It was down on, the, down on the south end of the lake, and that open water, was just floating in the open water down there. It's a story I heard. I <coughs> heard Tremendous amount of rumors where it's found. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I know. Well, from what I heard, it wasn't too far from where the 18.18 uh, state record was caught, which that's down on the south end of the lake, that point at the mouth of Little Caney. Um, uh, from what I heard, it wasn't found too far from there. So. But who knows? I mean, who, who knows? There's dead fish that was floating, weighed 20 or 21 pounds. I thought, um, God, what's that guy that caught the 18.18? 18? Uh, Barry St. Clair. St. Clair. I thought he caught that one in, in Indian. Or Mary St. Clair? Or was it the 17 pounder the next week that he caught in Indian? Well, well, he that, didn't that was, no, the six, it was a 16 pounder and that wasn't the next week. It was like two years later. Oh, okay. okay. So, see, there's all kinds of rumors. Well, I wasn't even born then. See, <laughs> these are the, but now we ask questions I know answers to, man. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you guys, you, I should have, I should have take, like, done this in the beginning or, Confiscated phones at the door. I gotta, feel like, I gotta feel like Google kicked my butt tonight a little bit. Other than Guthrie, Guthrie, he knew that one. That was pretty good. That was a good one. I can't believe I couldn't. Re and I knew that too. I just couldn't remember the year. You got another one, my What? We're giving that one? No. <laughs> no, give that one to me. No. Anyways, well, I guess uh, that pretty well concludes our, our seminar this week, man. Uh, huge crowd tonight. Huge crowd. Standing room only. Going down the stairs. Well, you gonna pass that bottle around? <laughs> <laughs> gonna have to wait a little bit. Get these next giveaway. <laughs> hey, we'll get we'll get these kids out of here. We'll turn up. As much brown water as he drinks, you think he's gonna pass this around? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. That's only on Tuesdays. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, and Thursdays and Sundays. <laughs> We're live three nights a week. So. Anyways, man, I, I can't thank you guys sincerely. I can't thank y'all enough, and, and I can't thank Lake Fort Marine enough. Please, if you need any tackle, go downstairs and buy it from these people right here. These are as fine of people, and they let us come in here and do this. 
every two weeks. We will be back here in two weeks, which will be like New Year's Day or New Year's Eve, something like that. We're going to be here. We don't stop this train for nothing. It don't ever get off the track. So, uh, y'all come back and see us. Thank y'all for joining us. Guys, David, Heath, Cord, Cody, thank all y'all. Thank you, guys. Thank you.